Good morning. Thank you for connecting as we uh, uh, journey in this study of the book of Acts. Uh, so far, it's been a joyful ride as we've seen the people of God wait upon him for the promise of the Father, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We saw how once the baptism in the Holy Spirit took place, the church uh, was so powerful, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're seeing the different things that are taking place in the church. So in the book of Acts, you know, we could uh, even look at it as different stages. We said Acts chapter 2, uh, there is the birth of the church, but then we can also consider uh, progression and look at the different stages uh, of the church. So today we'll talk a little bit about that and then continue uh, from the end of Acts chapter 6 where we had actually stopped. So uh, let's pray and uh, let's get into today's uh, session. Uh, let me begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, godly examples such as the book of Acts, Lord. Thank you, Father, uh, uh, for us, uh, Lord. You've given us a prototype church. Uh, Father God, as we consider the various features of the church, we pray that, Lord, uh, we as your body will be transformed to God. And the revival which uh, took place, Father God, uh, in the early church will, will be a part of our lives as well. Father God, we uh, truly desire, O oh God, for a deeper and a powerful work of the Spirit. Lord, uh, we pray you will do it in our times, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I shared with us that uh, uh, there are different stages that the church went through. So the birth of the church, uh, as we know, is uh, in Acts chapter 2 when they uh, have come together and the baptism in the Holy Spirit takes place. So the entire record of uh, the book of Acts is, it spans over 40 years roughly. So in these 40 years, we will see um, a move of God through God's people and the rising up of uh, a particular individual known as Apostle Paul, whose missionary journeys have impacted the the early church and they continue to impact us today. So we see how the gospel was really taken out of Jerusalem into various parts such as Asia Minor, Europe, uh, and also uh, up until the capital uh, capital of the world uh, at that point, which would be Rome. Uh, and there, there are certain other things that we saw, you know, we saw the features of the church, how they were people who prayed and stood in unity uh, in their faith and trust in God um, and uh, God was able to release the promises upon their lives. We also saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy and uh, in the first eight years uh, there is this community which is formed which is so filled with the Holy Spirit, so um, you know, transformed by the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit makes uh, such a difference uh, in their lives that they are uh, stepping out and they are being that witness that Jesus talked about in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So the first eight years, we could consider that uh, from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8. And then we move on from Acts chapter 9, when we continue, uh, we, we see another 10 years when the revival fires uh, that are in the early church begin to move to various parts of uh, 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 the world. And uh, eventually, you know, we will see that it's not just uh, the, like, it will be the church, of course, many different apostles in the church, but the rising up of Paul and especially the revival fire being carried through him. So that will be another 20 years. So what we are saying is uh, about 10 years of um, uh, or eight years of the church so, uh, sort of being established. And then the next uh, 10 years would be the church stepping out. So various apostles, believers stepping out and doing the work of the ministry. And eventually the 
final 20 years in the book of Acts is about Apostle Paul. So right now we are still in the first uh, eight years. And uh, by now we could say that, you know, about 7,000 people or so were part of the church because we saw that in, in uh, uh, the numbers on the very first day, 3,000 people were added. And when the lame man uh, gave his life to the lame man's miracle took place in Acts chapter 3, there were many others who responded. Uh, and so the church is now thriving. It's growing. And we saw so many other things. One was the uh, people who were coming into the church and the expansion of the kingdom of God or the kingdom work of God happening through the church. We also saw the uh, very many foundations of the church, such as the teaching of God's word, the fellowship which they had, the sharing, the prayer, uh, the, the meeting together to worship the Lord. So you know, these were the foundational activities of the church. We also saw how there was great reverence for God uh, among the people, even the outsiders, they were able to see these things and testify of the fact that these people really belonged to God and something unusual was taking place in their midst. We saw how uh, there was, <coughs> excuse me, there was great power and grace um, which was in the church and wonders, signs, miracles were performed. We also saw Excuse me, class. I don't know if it's got to do with the headphones here, that every time I wear the headphones, I'm sneezing away. But uh, yeah, hopefully I'll just adjust to this. Um, so great grace with uh, great power, signs, wonders, and miracles. That was a feature of the church. Now, all this is happening in the church, and uh, it's, it's really um, something to be in awe of. But at the same time, we saw that the world around was not so receptive and so there was opposition there was persecution uh, which the apostles as well as the church body had to face so that is also a reality that existed during those times and uh, beyond this there are other aspects i think in the last uh, section we also talked about uh, god's supernatural intervention and angelic visitation right so there were uh, several things to talk about within the church and outside the church. So finally, we looked at the fact that the church, while it was growing, there were some internal issues that came up and the leaders had to work with wisdom to resolve those matters. So that's where we were in Acts chapter 6. We saw that uh, for the distribution of food uh, uh, to the widows uh, there there were widows who were neglected in the daily distribution uh, and for for this for this issue uh, seven volunteers were selected we saw how their character their uh, testimony their walk with the lord was so important even though they were about uh, serving food to the people in need and uh, finally you know, towards the end of this passage, there is a description of a man called Stephen. So let's start with reading about Stephen and then we will continue into chapter 7. So Acts chapter 6 and verse 8 uh, is where we will begin. So can I request somebody to go ahead and read please Acts chapter 6 verse 8 all the way till, uh, fill, till verse 15. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the Sin... Uh, uh, sorry, I can't pronounce it. Uh, which part, uh, Zeli? First line. First line. Uh, Sirenians. What is Cyrenians. Okay. And those from Cilicia and Asia disputed with Stephen. 
and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, when uh, we have heard him speak blasphemous word against Moses and God, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who say, This man does not cease against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Yes, thank you, Zeli. So uh, in this particular passage, we continue to read about one of the volunteers, which would be Stephen. And uh, we saw earlier that he had a wonderful testimony. It was said about him that he was a man full of faith, Holy Spirit, uh, uh, you know, and uh, he was someone who was selected to serve tables. Now, that shows us that he is but a volunteer so he's not termed an apostle uh, or given any other leadership title but we have a little more to read about stephen in the verses that continue verse 8 where an additional uh, description is given regarding him full of faith we already saw that he was a man full of faith full of the holy spirit now it says full of power did great wonders and signs among the people. So that's something for us to think about, that it was not just the apostles, but even an ordinary person in the church or an ordinary volunteer in the church is moving in what? Power, great wonders, signs among the people. Somewhere in our thinking, we could be limited where we only assume that it would be the pastors or the elders or the bishops who are meant to walk in the power of God the way Stephen walked. But who is Stephen? He's just a volunteer. Okay. So today, as we equip the believers in our church, we can uh, trust and hope in God that the most ordinary of our congregation members would be able to walk in the power of God. Maybe uh, the, they are a child, but that is not a, a limitation for God to work through their lives or to uh, display his glory and splendor through their lives. So that's a good uh, understanding that we must have, that signs, wonders, and miracles are not limited only to the leadership. Now let's read on. We see now that Stephen got into trouble because remember we said in the first eight years, uh, great things were happening within the church, but persecution and opposition was also rising up on the other side. So Stephen was a victim of this kind of a persecution. So we uh, see that there was a group uh, and it's been mentioned here, arose uh, some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. So it was a set of people, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, uh, people from Sicilia, Cilicia and Asia. Later, you would notice that Cilicia is the place that Saul, who turned into Paul, came from. So Saul was a witness to what is going to take place uh, in Stephen's life. He was part of that uh, team or group that came against Stephen. What did this group do? They started disputing or quarreling with Stephen regarding what? They were accusing him and blaming him of uh, speaking blasphemous words or blasphemous is uh, speaking against God and the things of God. So it's mentioned there in verse 11, blasphemous words against Moses and God. And not only did they accuse him, but there is a scenario where they stir up the people around, meaning 
they are creating this atmosphere where even others have been informed regarding what Stephen has done and uh, people are beginning to rise up against Stephen. So now that there is an accusation, a strong accusation against Stephen, they seize him and bring him to the council. So earlier, the people who used to stand before the authorities were apostles. But here is a believer standing in front of the council now. So what's going to happen? And uh, they uh, accuse him. They say, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this place, holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So that is the accusation. Okay, Remember that. They say, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us, which is against what uh, uh, their beliefs and customs were all about. Uh, and as they were against Stephen, accusing him of these things, Luke also adds that the face of Stephen shone like the angels, okay? meaning the glory of God was upon him as he stood before the accusers. So God's presence was with him uh, when he was going through this accusation. Now, let us read chapter 7, uh, which will talk about the trial of this volunteer uh, and wonderful man by the name of Stephen. So we move on to chapter 7 now. And we're looking at the uh, interrogation process. So uh, I request somebody to go ahead and read, please. You can read, uh, start off with verse 1 and uh, could read till verse 8. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and Father, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to his land, this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot the twelve patriarchs. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rosalind, for that. Uh, we are noticing here that Stephen is presenting a defense, and in his defense, he is he is uh, revealing that he is well versed in the scriptures or he's well versed in um, the jewish scriptures so that is another important feature to look at because it only reminds us that the believers of the early church and stephen being an ordinary volunteer also knew scriptures quite well meaning they would have been uh, trained properly and, uh, you know, uh, equipped in the word of God. So he's presenting his defense uh, in a very well-informed way. He begins with the story of Abraham and how God led him out and, you know, what is happening through the life of Abraham. So there's this whole narration that he starts off with because he wants to lead this discussion to the Lord Jesus, very similar to the preaching of Peter in uh, Acts chapter 2, when he brings out, you know, the patriarchs and makes that connection to 
the Lord Jesus. So standing before the council, it's a very uh, intelligent way of making his defense because uh, the listeners are learned people. And, uh, uh, you know, Stephen's argument uh, was such that, you know, they, they, they could not have really uh, shot him down with their comments or shot him down with uh, the, the information uh, that they had. Because whatever he's saying here historically is quite accurate. So he is narrating from the life of Abraham and he's talking about the journey of the uh, Israelites and how God led them, how God brought them out and uh, how Abraham, uh, you know, had a son by the name of Isaac. And, uh, you know, then it, it went on to the following generation. So he's narrating this entire history. Let's just look at, you know, all the things that he has to say. So we'll continue reading. Uh, I would want to request another person maybe to please read from verse 9 and you can go on till verse 16. And the Patrick becoming in their soul, Joseph in Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph and was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph went and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died. He and our fathers, and they were carried back to Sechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham brought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Sechem. Yes, thank you, uh, Zali. Let's continue to read. Uh, another person can pick up from verse 17 and uh, go further ahead. So there's, there's a whole lot that he, he is talking about because he wants to come to a place of conclusion regarding worship. Uh, and uh, so when we flow through with the entire passage, we'll have a better understanding. So right now the background is being narrated. So verse 17 to maybe one person can read till 36, if that's okay with you. And then we'll again read the rest, another person. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleased to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set up, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as his son. And Moses was learned, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, he could take it to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him, who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For we suppose that this brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared of two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, said, Who made you a ruler and a judge? It is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for two years. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Rosie. So we have seen regarding Moses and uh, how Stephen is bringing out the fact that Abraham journeyed and then he had his descendants and then it came to a time when there was a man called Joseph who uh, God was with him and uh, he was taken to this land of Egypt where God established him and eventually came a generation in Egypt that did not know Joseph and because uh, they did not know Joseph and uh, his contribution to the nation Eventually, they started oppressing the Israelites who had moved into Egypt. Uh, and the, then we see how all the Israelites were in bondage uh, and they needed a deliverer. And God raised up a man by the name of Moses. So he's specifically talking about Moses. And you wonder why is uh, Stephen talking so much about Moses quite elaborately. He says how it came into his heart at the age of 40. Uh, it gives incredible hope to those who may be uh, older in years and you wonder what can I do for God. But at the age of 40, uh, Moses sort of becomes very conscious of going and uh, delivering his people. So uh, he's ready to go and he does, does it in his own way. He uh, goes and tries to deliver the Israelites in his personal strength and he uh, strikes uh, an Egyptian. But that was not God's way of bringing the deliverance to uh, the Israelites. So, you know, then we know that he went into the wilderness and uh, uh, he was, he fled to hide himself from Pharaoh because it was just not the right time for Moses to bring the deliverance. Another 40 years passed by. So you can think about the life of Moses. That's another sermon in itself, but we're not going to get into it. Stephen is only narrating the life uh, story of Moses, but we can see the depths of what he is stating here uh, as to how God took his man of deliverance through a journey and a, a preparation for him to actually uh, come up as this mighty man who uh, leads the, the people into the promised land. So the life of Moses, he is elaborately discussing about the life of Moses. Now the question, why, why are we talking about Moses? Because you see the accusation which was against him and we looked at it in Acts chapter 6 uh, and uh, verse uh, 14 uh, where he was accused with the statement that he is trying to change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So that is why he has to talk about Moses and the customs of Moses and justify himself before the council, the learned council, which is standing before him. And uh, that's the reason you know, he is going on about this. And he also needs to bring a defense uh, to the accusation where he was told that he spoke blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. Isn't it? Uh, and of course, they added to that saying, uh, he said that uh, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. 
So there are these accusations which are standing against him and Stephen is uh, speaking to the council to state that it is not so. I am justifying myself here. And in his speech or in his defense, you see great wisdom. You see, uh, even intellect is, is something that we could uh, point out. And so the council is amazed because here is an ordinary person standing and his face looks like the face of an angel, we were told. That simply shows that the presence of God was with him uh, as he was being opposed. So that gives us great assurance that when we go through times uh, uh, of being questioned, for doing the right thing for God, God's presence will be with us and uh, God's wisdom uh, will be given to us so that we too can face uh, our th those who are questioning us with the wisdom of God the way Stephen did. So that is why he's talking about Moses. Now let's see what else he says. Uh, we need to go from verse 37. Let's read till verse 43. Who's going to be the next list? Yes. Yeah. Sure. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him about Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers did not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years? The wilderness, O house of Israel, you also took up the tabernacle of the rope and the star of your God, Ramphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Uh, thank you. Let's let's just uh, read to the end of that section so another person can go ahead. <coughs> Till verse uh, 53. <coughs> so he will complete his, his speech uh, at verse 53. And we'll have a full picture of what he's actually trying to say. So uh, maybe Jackie, would you be able to read? In 44. Acts chapter 7, verse 44. A father had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought it with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in the temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the, the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed, him, gnashed at him with their teeth. 
But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Okay, thank you, Jafika. Uh, so you read the whole um, section, the whole chapter. Uh, so we'll, we'll just see, you know, what happened. Uh, initially, I mentioned that he spoke about the life of Moses because he wants to prove that he has done nothing to oppose the customs of Moses. And now he goes on to talking about the place of worship. Remember, the accusation was that he spoke against the place, the holy place and the law of God and that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy it. But he's giving his uh, explanation here and he's saying that God is a God who... Uh, he is the God of heaven. He actually does not need a place to dwell in. However, because the people, uh, you know, they also were insisting that they wanted a king, they wanted a place, uh, God went ahead, right? And uh, even though he's the God who dwells in heaven, he did instruct them regarding a place where his presence would come or the tabernacle. However, he, uh, he points out regarding the children of Israel in verse 51, he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears. Okay, so he is pointing to the fact that even when God gave instructions regarding worship, the children of Israel were such that they tried to do their own thing. They were against God. They were opposed to God uh, at the laws of God. So the point he's making is it's not that he is against God, but he is reminding uh, the same generation of their forefathers and the fact that their forefathers were also those who opposed the house of God, who opposed the, uh, the laws of God. And he is then telling these people that they are also stiff-necked. Stiff -necked. And that their hearts are actually not committed. So when he says uncircumcised in the heart and ears, he just means that their hearts are not committed to God. And he's showing them that the previous uh, generations were against what God was doing in their midst. They were against the Holy Spirit. And he's telling them, so are you. You know, you're also doing the same thing. Uh, and the fathers that you are so proud of, they were the ones who persecuted the prophets and they killed those who were telling about the coming of the Lord Jesus or the Messiah uh, or the Christ here he uses the term the just one and he says that these people are now following in the footsteps of their fathers who opposed the work of God uh, in the past and they killed prophets and these people are doing the same thing so He's trying to bring them to a place of conviction. Uh, and he is telling them that, you know, they need to uh, really wake up to what God is doing and not oppose the work of God, not oppose the move of God. Uh, so the people, the forefathers, they resisted, resisted God's work. They even resisted Moses and the laws which were give it to Moses, right? So then it's it's like him saying, you know, what is this? Uh, wh what are you accusing me about? Because starting from your forefathers till you, you are also opposing the work of God. It's not me who's opposing the work of God, but it is you who's opposing the work of God. So this is what he is sharing uh, to the council. Earlier I said that we must appreciate uh, his his uh, understanding of scriptures, his uh, speaking with wisdom. Uh, but then another very important thing that we must appreciate is his boldness. 
because he's standing before the council and he is bold enough to present a defense. So these are all things about Stephen that we can be so uh, yeah, sort of, uh, we can comment about him. Now, when Stephen gave his, he presented his argument, uh, people were touched. So that same uh, phrase which we saw when Peter preached, cut to the heart, you know, that is uh, mentioned over here. People were cut to the heart or they were convicted about what he was uh, saying. But at the same time, you know, it, it affected many of them negatively. And so they gnashed at him is what uh, the scriptures say. That means that they hated what he said or they did not like what he spoke. Uh, and the opposition obviously has risen to the point where they are ready to uh, kill him. Okay, But at that point, how is Stephen? Now, this is again, it adds to the testimony of Stephen. Stephen, a man full of faith, full of wisdom, full of power. We saw all these three things. And right now, he's a, again, as a man full of the Holy Spirit, gazing into heaven and seeing the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So that reveals to us that he is a man who is sensitive to the communication of the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember when we talk about uh, the prophetic, we say dreams, visions, uh, trances, so many ways in which God actually speaks uh, to his people. So Stephen, at a very crucial moment, Beyond seeing the opposers who are standing in front of him, he's seeing a vision of heaven. Okay, his spirit man, his spirit eyes are open like the prophets of old, and he's seeing a vision or a picture of heaven. He is full of the Holy Spirit and he is gazing into heaven. What does he see? Two things the glory of God. Why? Because the heaven is filled with the glory of God. So that awe uh, he must have sensed in those moments, the glory of God. Secondly, it says Jesus standing at the right hand of God, which is very precious because we usually talk about being seated at the right hand of God, isn't it? Uh, we are seated in Christ in the heavenly places. So sitting down, uh, some commentaries say that sitting down is a sign of completing the work. When Jesus finished his work on the earth, he went and he sat down up in heaven. But in this particular instance, we see that Jesus was standing, standing at the right hand of God. And commentators say that uh, standing up is a symbol of honor. So even the Lord Jesus, looking at the boldness of Stephen and his witness, that, you know, he could have just run away or he could have denied the way Peter denied Jesus. He could have denied Christ, but he stood up for the truth. He stood up uh, for what he believed and he was ready, even if it meant that his own life uh, will be sacrificed for the faith. And it shows how God sees or how God perceives or receives this kind of faith. It's like Jesus is honoring by standing up for Stephen up in heaven and saying, good job, you know, Stephen. So that's the way some commentators have put it, that Jesus standing at the right hand of God, where God is, where Jesus is proud of his man uh, of the hour, Stephen. And, uh, you know, Stephen, he views this picture and he says, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So he is narrating his vision to the listeners. Uh, and that's what is going on. But the end is very sad for Stephen uh, because there is an uproar. People didn't like what he said. And he is actually uh, cast out of the city and stoned. Once you know, uh, he is killed, we are told that his clothes were laid at the feet of a young man named as Saul. Remember, we saw the 
synagogue of the freed men where silesia is mentioned that is the place of uh, uh, like you know paul is from silesia and uh, right now there is his first mention in the book of acts here at the martyrdom of stephen so uh, it is understood that when the clothes were laid at saul's feet it was most likely that the leader of the team uh, that went to persecute stephen was saul so saul was the head uh, of the group that killed stephen so that is who saul is so gives us a picture of what he might have believed and uh, uh, you know how he hated those who trusted in the lord jesus uh, but you know it's a very sad time when uh, a volunteer or a, a, a believer of the church is killed uh, for his faith and you know we we are told they stored stephen uh, and what was stephen doing think about this this again is so precious he's been stored meaning he is hurt that in pain and uh, you know uh, devastated uh, traumatized put to shame so much is happening to him physically emotionally uh, but spiritually you look at the the strength of the uh, spiritual person Uh, at the strength of his character in these moments of great difficulty stephen says lord jesus receive my spirit the way jesus you know said that and one more thing he says lord do not charge them with this sin isn't he a true disciple of jesus what did jesus say on the cross he said these very same words he offered up his spirit to the lord because his life was about god at the purpose of which god had called him so that's what jesus did he offered up his spirit secondly jesus uh, uh forgave he forgave the uh, persecutors in the same way stephen is forgiving his persecutors and he said do not charge them with this sin and the scriptures say that he fell asleep what a great man uh, and, and you know what would we do if we were in the position of stephen Uh, being stored uh, for the faith which we have uh, would we be able to rejoice in the spiritual reality of the glory of god and be able to picture the love the honor uh, that uh, jesus is pouring out on our lives uh, and then even be in a position to forgive our persecutors so many things for us to think about Uh, but uh, what an inspiration and what a standard uh, what an example that stephen is uh, as a, even as a martyr to the church of jesus christ so uh, an impactful life uh, let's go ahead for a break right now we'll come back uh, in 10 minutes and continue with acts chapter 8 where the excitement will only build up further okay so i see you all in 10 minutes thank you <laughs> 